I've, I've been more familiar with the pairing of, of D3 and K2. Um, I think that's really important. I know next to nothing about the sulfur. So all of those, I think, would be awesome to go through and why they're important. And, and also, if they are really, truly not present in our current diets that we absolutely really should or we have to supplement with. Right. Well, so the reason everyone has to supplement these things is because we have something in our food that is unavoidable and it's a chelator. So what that means is it will take metals out of availability. So magnesium is a, is a metal uh, mineral element and it'll be taken out of commission. Sulfur will be taken out of commission. And this is called glyphosate. This is the toxin that is in all the food that's in every box all across America. And even in some of the ones that say non-GMO, I don't necessarily believe that. I've been testing some stuff and labels are labels. But the reason this is going on is because we're literally being poisoned with this chemical. This chemical destroys our gut microbiome. It's an antibiotic and it takes metals out of the mix. And one third thing that it does, it gets substituted for one of your main amino acids. And so it gets incorporated into our collagen and every bit of our fiber. We're being poisoned on a molecular level by people who don't even need the money. And it's destroying the, the microbiome of the planet and the microbiome of our bodies. This is what's killing the bees. And you can't avoid it. It's in uh, a newborn's uh, 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 baby's urine. It's everywhere. So you can't get rid of it. Just how do you sort of work around it? So that's why supplementing magnesium, and in my opinion, sulfur is so important. These weren't required 20 years ago. This started in 1995, 1997. The last 20, 30 years has just been amplifying. So every day we're being poisoned. Our gut microbiome is being poisoned more by this stuff that you can't see, smell, taste, or touch. It's there. You just don't know it. So that's why I think those other minerals are important. But real quickly, vitamin K2 is simple. If you have vitamin D, you want to have vitamin K2 because once you bring in the calcium into your body, it's going to stay in your arteries. There are two enzymes that bind calcium and take that calcium in and out of your cartilage and bone. And those two enzymes are vitamin K2 dependent, meaning if there's no vitamin K2, those enzymes are just sitting around texting each other. They got nothing to do. Those enzymes will regulate how your nasal septum calcifies, whether you can breathe, breathe through your nose, those enzymes will regulate how much calcium gets into your jaw. Will I have room for my wisdom teeth? Will I have room for all of my 32 teeth? And the answer is no, if you don't have enough vitamin K2. When you see people with a weak jaw, that's a vitamin K2 deficiency, and it's critical for health. Now, vitamin K2 activates 18 known enzymes. So there's more, probably more by now, but that's really important. And where does K2 come from? It comes from the milk and meat, of animals that eat green growing grass, the greener the grass, the higher the K2. It doesn't get, it gets destroyed in raw milk and it's only found in a little hard cheeses. I say, if I'm gonna supplement one thing, aside from vitamin D, it's gonna be vitamin K2 and then magnesium. This is critical, that I call them the terrific trio. So magnesium is easy because magnesium activates ATP. Every single molecule of ATP, adenosine triphosphate, is a little rechargeable battery that gives your body a little bit of power. That little battery pack does not get ignited or activated without magnesium. So if you don't have enough magnesium, you cannot make enough energy. Magnesium is also a cofactor for many, many different enzymes. And our bodies are run by these enzymes. If you don't have the cofactors that activate them, you're not going to be healthy. And that'll leave us to sulfur, which I do want to talk about, but I, I'll let you, let you ask any questions about those too. And those are the ones that you'll hear in other podcasts. Um, I don't have any great information on those other than what you've probably heard before. Gotcha. Okay. So two quick questions before we move on to sulfur. Um, when we're taking D and K2, do we want to consume those? That, do we want to take the supplement with fat since they're fat soluble? So I don't care. I, well, I just want my patients to take them. I don't think it's as critical as people are thinking, but sure. It's, um, you know, it's fat soluble. So sure. If you have some, you're eating some fat, that might be better. Um, I personally... I'm just more worried that people are going to take the right dose for the right amount of time in the right way. I personally don't, unless you're doing a ton of intermittent fasting and you're like me, I'm an OMAD, eat one meal a day, but I do have some bulletproof coffee. So um, if I'm going to have my bulletproof coffee, I can take my vitamins that has some fat in it. So I'm not, I'm not really that worried about it. Okay, perfect. Yeah, that's kind of what I do with my diet as well. Um, what about, I know this is going to vary widely, but how, how do you know supplementation as, as far as amount, especially with vitamin D? So rule of thumb that I like to use is it's 1,000 international units per 25 pounds. 100 pound woman, 4,000 IU. Um, and you, you know, you can do the math for a 200 pound man, 8,000 8, uh, 8, IU. 
And it doesn't matter. Vitamin D is not about how much you took during that day. It's your level. When you're taking that vitamin D, it gets transformed into a storage form called 25 OHD. That's the one that your doctor measures. That's important to have a high level because your body stores it everywhere, especially in your fat. But it will only be allowed to use the vitamin D that's available to activate it into the active form when you want that. So when you're dosing vitamin D, it really depends on a lot of things, your body size, sunlight exposure, your skin tone, um, what kind of food you eat, all these different factors. It's not that critical. I want my patients to have a level always over 40, always, preferably in the 60 to 80 range. If you're in Canada, that's 150 to 200 nanomoles to make things more, more confusing. Now, when I say take 8,000 or 10,000 IU of vitamin D, sometimes my patients are like, oh my God, are you trying to kill me? What, a 10,000 international units of vitamin D is 0.25 milligrams. So when I say to somebody, I've got 0.25 cats here and I've got 10,000 cats here, you're like, well, it's not even a whole cat. That's not very much. Whoa, that's a lot of cats. 10,000 of anything is a massive amount and it makes you scared. But you're not a, a statistician, mathematician, chemist, or whatever. I did the research and 10,000 IU is 0.25 milligrams. 40,000 IU is one milligram. So you know, what does that mean? It doesn't mean anything unless you understand um, biology. It really doesn't. So yeah. um, it, depending where you live and your sun exposure, um, you may need to take a higher amount. If you're really low, you want to take a loading dose. I think that 20,000 IU, international units per day, is the maximum I recommend on a regular basis because that's how much you could make in the sun if you were to suntan at noon in your bathing suit. So I think it's still physiologic, meaning that it's not unnatural. I wouldn't take it without vitamin K2 and magnesium, but that's the highest dose I tell people to take when they're low. Say, hey, take 20,000 for a couple of weeks and then lower it down. And then you wanna test yourself. This is one of the most important markers for cancer. This is something that really deserves more respect in the same way, like when you go to, I, when I found out what vitamin D was, I was blown away because I did the research on cancer and I came to the conclusion that all the people who had cancer had really low vitamin D. And then they'd say like, we don't know if the cancer lowered the vitamin D or if the low vitamin D caused the cancer. Like, well, both. Once you get sick, when your vitamin D level drops, you get sick. Once you're sick, it'll drop your D level even further. But that association, I started to say this one thing and I still really believe this. There's nobody on this planet who ever got an initial diagnosis of cancer that had a high vitamin D level. I don't believe that's ever happened. Traditionally, someone will get a diagnosis of cancer. If they get a vitamin D test, if they're lucky, they'll find it's probably below 10. And I've seen that many times. Wow. Yeah, very common, okay? Who gets, um, you know, the the uh, there, there's the infection, um, uh, there, there's a couple of different, MRSA, methicillin resistant staph aureus. Who gets that? People with low vitamin D. Who, well, people who are immunocompromised. Well, who's immunocompromised? the people with low vitamin D because vitamin D regulates the immune system. So it's kind of like a circular discussion. And I believe that really all of these things are completely related to vitamin D because of how profound this is in your body. So when it comes to dosing, overdose, don't, I would rather have you, I don't want anyone to go past hundred, but I see people at 200 or higher. No one's ever died from a vitamin D overdose. It just hasn't happened. Don't do wow. it. Don't do it. Millions of people have died from too low vitamin D. Yeah. When, when you go to your doctor, if your vitamin D level is up really high, don't let your doctor panic you. You won't have any symptoms. Stop supplementing. Let it go down. Do not panic. You don't want to run it too high, but don't be nervous about taking three, four, five, eight, ten thousand 10,000 IU vitamin D. You've got to do it daily, day after day, week after week for it to build up in your body. That's how vitamin D is. It's not like other vitamins that you take. It goes into your body and it's done. Vitamin D is fat soluble and will accumulate in all of your your adipose your fat tissue yep. yeah okay, so that answers your that answers yeah your absolutely and i don't know how many times we plugged this app on this show but dminder you've got to get dminder to at least learn about this stuff and you can see on dminder it does show you that accumulation whether from supplementation or from the sun and then doing things like putting your weight your skin type is, is it cloudy outside it, it helps you understand how to get vitamin d naturally and also what supplementation does yeah. Well, also, uh, one of the, the, the tips that I like to give people is that when you're outside, if your shadow is shorter than your height, you're making vitamin D. Once your shadow is longer than your height, and you can look at a, a fire hydrant or a signpost, when the sun has come down and that shadow that it casts is longer than the height of the object, vitamin D is over. The sun has to be high enough in the sky to be strong enough to break 
the bond on cholesterol because vitamin D is made from cholesterol on your skin. And if the sun isn't that high, you're not going to make vitamin D. It's still healthy to be in the sun. But if you intend to go out to make vitamin D, you won't be making vitamin D unless your shadow is shorter than your height. That is such a great point. I learned that on a shirtless walk yesterday afternoon, as I heard you say that on another podcast, it was very sad to know that it was about an hour and a half after solar noon, right here in Salt Lake City, my shadow is a little bit taller than mine was. It probably could be a, a much better basketball player than me. But uh, yeah, really, really sad that up at my latitude, there is a time during the year where you can't generate vitamin D. Although I completely agree with you. That's not the only reason to stay in the sun. And so yeah, I but also Utah it. has a high elevation. So uh, the D determinants are like, what's your latitude? What's your elevation? What's the clarity of the sky? Are you in a tropical environment? Because all these things will filter the amount of, of sunlight that comes through. So they're all factors that you want to think about. Yeah, so important. I love that. One quick question on magnesium. Do you, Is there a certain type that you prefer or a way that you like to get magnesium in the body? So the best way you can get magnesium in your body is from oysters, shellfish, that type of stuff. I supplement, I have my own vitamin line that I, I'm working with a company that's in the U.S. called Orthomolecular. And it's a, it's a combination of several different magnesiums together. Um, I only like to go so far down these rabbit holes. I'm more interested in communicating the importance. I don't really know which is the best, but mine's a combination. And I know that um, uh, they do a lot of research and I feel like they think this is a good uh, mixture of products. So that's what I recommend as well. Um, I think that the, you know, also you can really get magnesium from Epsom salts, baths, or being the ocean transdermal. Yeah. I think that's a good way to get it too. That's great. I love that. Okay. Let's talk about sulfur. This again is something that I know very little about. Why is that so important? Sure. Well, very people, very few people are thinking about this and where this came from was when I got into this whole area uh, of, you know, I, I founded all these different things. I came across a researcher by the name of Stephanie Seneff, and I've done some podcasts with her. She's genius. I am in love with this woman. She's so smart. And she did a presentation about sulfur and um, a, an enzyme called endothelial nitric oxide synthase or ENOS. And that is a, um, a cartoon character that I have from one of my movies because this enzyme is so important. You know about endothelial nitric oxide synthase from um, nitric oxide, because I know that the biohacking community is all familiar with nitric oxide, because when sunlight hits you, you actually produce nitric oxide, which is a vasodilator, okay? But this enzyme also produces another product, and that product is actually called cholesterol sulfate. So this enzyme, it's a moonlighting enzyme, and it has two different jobs, all right? So why is that important? Why have you not heard of it? Well, it's not very exciting stuff, to be honest with you, but ultimately, I want to ask you a question and how I want to come to sulfur is I want to ask you this. So, you know, that, I mean, red meat, does it cause cancer? No. Okay. Red meat, does it cause heart disease? No. Okay. So what's the root cause? So I, I'm with you. I don't believe that eggs, butter, or cheese, grass fed, organic stuff, and red meat or fat. I don't believe eating any, eating any of that causes heart disease. If that's the case, then what is the root cause of heart disease? What's the alternative theory? That's a great question. I think a lot of people would blame sugar. And I think there's a strong case to be made there. But I do feel like it's that that can't be the only thing. There's got to be a we, lot more to we, it. We were eating sugar in the 1920s and people did not have heart disease. OK, mm -hmm. we were eating sugar in the 1930s and 40s and we did not have heart disease. Heart disease came a little later on. And um, there's a bunch of different factors that I believe come together. So if if what's the root cause of cardiovascular disease if it's not what everyone's saying? Well, I'm going to tell you that it's four prong and it is my foundational four. It's a vitamin D3, vitamin K2, magnesium, and sulfur deficiency. And where sulfur comes into this is you have something in all of your arteries and blood vessels called the glycocalyx. Now, this is a word that you may not have heard before but I can guarantee you, you're going to hear about it. It's in my songs. And I have a track that Sulphur sings. It's called um, Wet and Wild. And so Sulphur is one of my main characters because um, it's so important in your body. And so Sulphur is essential in the creation of easy water. It's essential in creating those layers of gelled water. And especially it's essential for the proteoglycans, for the, the actual molecules that go into your arteries that are embedded in there to create a very um, negative charge with the sulfur atoms because sulfur has a negative charge. 
and it will start to bring water to it. And it creates easy water in layers that lubricates. And it lubricates everything. Every mucous membrane of your body wants to do this. If you felt a fish and you felt that slimy sensation, you're feeling that easy water that is there from sulfur that's happening on those fish. So when it gets into the heart, you have to understand that the blood vessel itself is very delicate. Our, our endothelial cells are one cell thin. This is thin. But we have this, these protrusions into the cell membrane of these proteoglycans. These are sugars and proteins that are, get collected with, with sulfur. And that sulfur draws water to it. And it creates this smooth, slick, easy water. And that's what sulfur does. One of the things it does. Now, fascinatingly enough, we have to start to think about, well, when I say cholesterol sulfate, you say, well, cholesterol, do you think cholesterol is bad? Well, you know that it's not. And people ask me, well, what about the bad cholesterol? There is no bad cholesterol. Cholesterol is a molecule. It's, I think, 26 carbons, okay? We're ta they're talking about the carriers or the, the ferry boats that bring cholesterol around. Well, what if I told you that that whole system of ferrying cholesterol was only secondary to how we're supposed to transport cholesterol? It's Thank supposed you. to be transported along with sulfur, as in cholesterol sulfate. Cholesterol is hydrophobic. It's terrified of the water. It will not go into your blood. Sulfur is hydrophilic. It, it lives in water. So I created these cartoon characters. Sulfur is the king of the hydrophiles, and cholesterol is queen of the hydrophobes. And when they get joined together, now you have a, model, a, a, a molecule that's amphiphilic. One end has got a charge. That's the sulfur end. It can go in the water. And the other end doesn't have a charge it's cholesterol but this molecule can go into the blood and now you can traffic or transport cholesterol everywhere in the body because cholesterol is your repair molecule and that molecule of cholesterol sulfate will insert itself into your cell membrane and leave the sulfur behind to, to contribute to the glycocalyx or any mucous membrane lining so and that reaction is caused by sunlight so in sunlight this enzyme grabs cholesterol and sulfur and joins them together now this new molecule, this is your repair duo. Cholesterol and sulfur go around your body into your fascia, into every part of your body to deliver cholesterol for repair sake and to lubricate. Sulfur is also a powerful antioxidant because it has a negative four charge, generally speaking, and it protects you from radiation, protects you from chemicals. I take sulfur before I go in the sun knowing that I'm going to be making cholesterol sulfate. The sulfur itself protects you. And even one step further, the molecule cholesterol sulfate goes to your DNA and stimulates the production of a cross link protein that goes in your skin to protect you from sunlight. So sulfur itself and the cholesterol sulfate molecule, they contribute to your body's natural sun protection. So when I go in the sun, I take my sulfur well before I don't burn. I don't burn because sulfur protects me from radiation. I don't burn because um, I have a base tan. I don't burn because this actual chemical that your body's making is building up like a mesh that diffuses sunlight. This is part of our body's natural defense. And the sulfur has been removed from our food chain with processed foods and glyphosate. So that's the last one that I insist on supplementing. I think it's really critical. And I believe that sulfur deficiency is truly at the core of cardiovascular disease because what you need to have is an area of the glycocalyx that becomes open to getting scraped and, and, and brutalized. And then you have calcium building up there because you don't have vitamin K2. And then the blood vessels themselves don't function properly because vitamin D regulates um, the uh, angiotensin converting enzyme. The, the whole water system of your body is trying to be regulated. And all of these things, these four separate things gang up and ultimately I believe are the root cause of cardiovascular disease. I think I could prove it to you with at least 200 to 300 studies, but I can just ask you to use your common sense is that, well, yeah, if you take a protected area and you remove its protective coating, that area is going to start to get damaged. And that cholesterol, that's your body trying to fix it. That's not the cholesterol from your food getting stuck there. That's just not the case. I call that non-scientific extrapolation. So I think that organic sulfur called MSM is critical and it's been around forever. A lot of uh, homeopaths, naturopaths, chiropractors know about it. It's just not mainstream and it's kind of, it doesn't taste that good. It doesn't stink. It's just kind of hard to incorporate into your life, but it's doable. And I, I really want to, I want to supplement that because I know how critical it is.